There's an old saying in government that politics stops at the water's edge. In other words, when it comes to foreign policy, the U.S. operates with just one voice. We can fight among ourselves here, but to the rest of the world, we're on the same page. Except, it seems here that the president's only, well, the Republican majority in Congress seems to have forgotten that old adage. Last week, Republicans, as we all talked about on the show, and I'm sure you followed, they gave Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu a hero's welcome at a joint session where he got up and he spoke against the president's uh, negotiations with Iran and basically telling us what our foreign policy ought to be. But now it goes one step forth, further. 47 Republican senators authored a letter to the Iranian government essentially threatening to tear up any agreement that the president makes with Iran if they can. Republicans reminded Iranian leaders, gave them a civics lesson, that any agreement made without Congress's say-so can be rescinded if a Republican wins the White House, and also reiterated that there is no way that Congress will approve any deal. Now, cue the Democrat response. First, Harry Reid, he blasted the letter from the Senate floor. Let's be very clear. Republicans are undermining our commander-in-chief while empowering the Atollas. This letter is a hard slap in the face of not only the United States, but our allies. This is not a time to undermine a commander-in-chief purely out of spite. It's unprecedented for one political party to directly intervene in an international negotiation with the sole goal of embarrassing the President of the United States. Now, this afternoon, we also heard from the President. I, I think it's somewhat ironic uh, to see uh, some members of Congress wanting to make common cause with the hardliners in Iran. Uh, it's an unusual coalition. Uh, I think what we're going to focus on right now is actually seeing whether we can get a deal or not. And uh, once we do, then we'll, uh, if we do, then we'll be able to make the case to the American people. And uh, I'm confident we'll be able to implement it. And beyond trying to influence foreign policy, the Senate's top Republican, he's also encouraging states here to ignore administration policy when it comes to environmental regulations. So forget what the Fed says. Ms. McConnell, in an op-ed, tells states, hey, you know what? Turn your backs on Obama's mandate for clean power regulations, writing, refusing to go along at this time would give the courts time to figure out if it's even legal and it would give Congress more time to fight back, adding, we're devising strategies now to do just that. Listen. It's big boy politics, I get it, you know, but the idea to try and undermine the president and the administration when they're negotiating with a country that's trying to get nuclear capabilities, not just in terms of giving a form to someone that's going to take it on U.S. soil in the U.S. Capitol, but then writing a letter to Iran saying, we don't care what the president does with you, we're going to get rid of it as soon as we can, and then to tell the states, forget the law, do it your own way. I, I don't know, maybe I've got a really short memory, but I don't remember it getting this bad. I don't know if this is unprecedented, but it's certainly very rare, and I can't think of uh, any particular instance where something like this has occurred. The president is our negotiator with, our, with, with, the, with, our far, with the foreign countries, and um, when he's negotiating with, with Iran, uh, it, it, to me it is completely uh, out of bounds for the other party to decide that they're going to write letters uh, to the people that the president's negotiating with. It's just, it's, it's outrageous. When it comes to, domestic, comes to the do domestically, what's going on is, you know, whether it's, you know, to follow Obamacare or to, uh, to, 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 uh, to be involved in any of the federal requirements that the president has laid out, um, this is probably in, res uh, 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 in retaliation to their, the GOP's, um, allegations that the president has violated the Constitution in a number of ways. So this is a volley that's going back and forth, but I mean the president's the president and the only one who hasn't respected this president is the GOP. And its own, and as well, Democrats, look, they're not as well organized as the GOP, and sometimes they get on board and, uh, and start attacking our own president as well. And this could be an hors d'oeuvre, Andrew, because you look at the budget calendar, you've got some real important stuff here. It's not just some salvos uh, that I might find it forget treason, it's just completely offensive what they did. You got big stuff on the calendar coming up that people have to act like big boys and girls to figure out. Well, the irony is that Republicans seem to be completely united on opposing anything the President Obama does, whether it's on foreign policy or whether it's on domestic policy, as you heard from Mitch McConnell, but they're absolutely divided 
when it comes to domestic budgeting issues and how to run the government and keep the government afloat. And if you look at a calendar of some upcoming uh, deadlines that we're facing, I mean, you've got uh, problems just coming up this month, if we can uh, pop that up. Uh, it's, you've got a, a cut in Medicare reimbursements that's coming in April, and there's no agreement on how to deal with that. The Highway Trust Fund will go bankrupt in May unless you approve a new tax. The Import-Export Bank, which is huge in terms of uh, our, our international trade. And then in October, you've got the budget or government shutdown, the debt limit, and sequester cuts that are all coming. And meanwhile, Republicans can't get together and agree to keep the Department of Homeland Security open. And it's uh, this whole fight here, um, and also how they're handling the fight, it's also the subject of our question tonight here that we're asking you at home here about specifically how the Republicans are handing Iran, handling Iran. Is the party playing Russian roulette with foreign policy? Um, my answer to this question is yes here, but you may disagree. Either way here, make your opinion heard on Facebook and Twitter. All right, now we transition to... Hillary Clinton, and what will she do as criticism mounts about her use of personal email while Secretary of State? CNN reporting that Clinton may address this issue within the next 48 hours, pushed, of course, in no small part by mounting pressure and criticism. Now, first, President Obama essentially said the White House knew nothing about how Hillary had her email set up. At the same time, uh, everybody else learned it through news reports. The policy of my administration is to encourage transparency. Uh, and that's why my emails, the BlackBerry that I carry around, uh, all those records are uh, available and, and archived. Now, I know this might shock you here, but Republicans were eager to pounce on the email issue. Did she comply with the public integrity requirement? No, she didn't. Do we know what's in those emails? Did those emails reveal things about Benghazi that she asked what difference does it make? The Clintons come trailing clouds of entitlement and concealment. Okay, but adding to all of this was at least one person who wouldn't come under a usual suspect to this, um, the idea that Hillary can just ride this out by being silent. Take a look what a top Democrat effectively putting Hillary Clinton on notice. I think that she needs to step up and come out and state exactly what the situation is. And finally, there's might be the most influential criticism of them all. Hillary and her email got the SNL treatment this past weekend. Recently, it was revealed that while I was Secretary of State, I did not use a government email. I used a personal one, leading many to believe I was hiding scandalous or incriminating emails. And to those people, I'd like to say, nice try. <laughs> Those emails are clean as a whistle. This is not how Hillary Clinton goes down. My work emails are professional, and my emails with friends are innocent and fun. Like this one, a friend wrote to me, hey girl, still up for a movie tonight? I heard that new Bradley Cooper one is hot. What do you want to see? And I responded with, I want to see myself as president of the United States of America. See, just fun woman talk. Um, first off, you think she's got to address this, this isn't going to go away, or does she only make it worse if she has some uh, big to do on this thing? Because people aren't going to believe, no matter what she says, that right. we're seeing the whole drill. Right. First of all, she has to address the issue head on. There's no other way around it. Second of all, as of now, it appears that it's much ado about nothing. This is just another way of giving CPR to a congressional investigation into Benghazi that has gone absolutely nowhere. If Republicans think at the end of the day, you're going to get every email of Hillary Clinton's. And second of all, let me just say this, Richard. I've been with her privately in many settings. She's one of the smartest people I know. She's not stupid enough okay, well, to put me, emails on her emails and in, in, in personal emails. If that's emails. the case, how did she think that her trove of emails wasn't going to become an issue that she had a separate setup <clears> for that everyone else didn't. We'll find out when she decides to address the issue. Um, and there may be a good excuse and there may not be. Um, this is one of those cases where if the Republicans only knew how to speak in at six decibels instead of 28, they really might have something. The, 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 there's a legitimate discussion to be had here and she needs to explain. But to move immediately from this to the world is ending, the, the, the chicken little theory of Republican internal politics, who can be the most negative, who can be the most outrageous, 
really hurts their own cause when a quiet, more precise uh, criticism would have gone a long way to make people think this wasn't possible. And I have to agree there. There is something here. There's no question. Why wouldn't she use the government email address? There's only run one reason you would use an alternate email address, and that's because you want to make sure that the people don't see what you're writing, okay? And, and, that, and that goes on. And I think if they investigate other elected officials, they'll find that a lot of them do a very similar, very similarly set up. Uh, in this case, I'm sure when you look at all emails, I mean, I was a prosecutor, I was an inv inv investigator, I understand is when you look at a, a lot of information, you can find what you're looking for a lot of times. And the question will become, and I think Dominic pointed out, will, sh will they get all her emails? And what will she say about it? And you think the biggest worry in Clinton land is uh, the might be something that turns up here that is going to hurt us, or is it more? It, it just fed this narrative out there that they love to play by their own set of rules here. They feel that they're above everything. There's always some baggage you got to deal with. You never know from one week to the next either what Bill's going to say, do, or Hillary's going to. Uh, that I it's just that old. I think clip. a lot of it speaks to that second point, in, including the whole sense that you know not only can we do what we want, but they're you know the, we just bend the rules. Uh, and the rules don't apply to us as they apply, and there's always going to be baggage. And I think the second concern out of this is really for low information voters, which is let's say the Benghazi committee gets all of her personal emails and they find some personal juicy tidbit about Bill or about Chelsea or about whatever. I mean, that feeds the narrative also that there's so much more to this family beyond the political. Yep. And, and I think that's a danger also. Yeah, but it feeds to them as information. This is what it is, is if nothing else, they get a treasure trove yep. of information. It may not be ind indictable. It may not even be anything to get a wrist slapped on. But on the other hand, is there's going to be a lot of information and if they, they could get their and hands every day you on do this, this. You lose a news cycle day because then you got to answer it, and then that's how and this will be going on days be going for a weeks. long time. Yes. This could be going on right through the campaign. When we come back, we're going to head over to New Jersey, where Senator Bob Menendez says he's confident that he will beat the corruption charges he's facing. Menendez said didn't do anything wrong. But what do the charges mean here for the senator's political future? And should he even have put himself in this position in the first place? We'll talk about that and also Chris Christie's arrangement with Exxon when we come back.